Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, clearly the photo that you see on your screen is a little, a few years old because I've got COVID hair now. Anyway, uh, we have a great slate of speakers who represent different perspectives in the Chinatown International District. I'll be the moderator this evening. Um, we'll begin with an overview of the community by Dr. Marie Wong, and then we'll hear from four other distinguished speakers. I'm sure many of you will have questions for our speakers, and we look forward to having a robust discussion about one of Seattle's most unique and historic neighborhoods. The Chinatown ID's history and cultural significance are recognized by its designation as a local historic district called the International Special Review District, established in 1973. It is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places as the Seattle Chinatown Historic District established in the mid 1980s. Without these historic district designations, the neighborhood would be a different place today. That's not to say that there are no pressures from development. There is a lot of that going on given its proximity to downtown, public transit and the sports stadia. How this change is managed is key and we're so glad that there are people and organizations in the community who work hard every day to maintain and enhance the neighborhood's cultural relevance. We'll hear from some of them today. First up is Dr. Marie Wong, AKA Doc Wong, Professor Emeritus at Seattle University's Institute of Public Service, Asian Studies and Public Affairs. Marie's teaching and research interests are in urban studies, including housing, urban and architectural history, land use development, sustainability, and in Asian American studies. Her most recent publication entitled Building Tradition Pan-Asian Seattle and Life in the Residential Hotels is a must read and a great addition to your local history library. Marie has presented talks and conducted tours of the CID for Historic Seattle in the past, and we're delighted that she joins us this evening. She developed the history link tour of the CID. We hope you've had a chance to go online to view the tour. If not, we're sure um, you'll want to do so after hearing from Marie tonight. Uh, Marie, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Eugenia. First of all, I want to let everybody know how happy I am to have the opportunity to briefly talk with you about how the tour was developed. And I'm glad that there's so much interest in this, that there's so many people who wanted to join tonight um, to learn about the district, um, the tour, and to interact with um, a really great panel of speakers that will be able to tell you uh, specifically how how they engage in planning, community development, and preservation. Um, in the 10 minutes that I have, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about the information of why I was interested in doing this project in the first place, the tour parameters, the goals that I had for the tour, and also the role that I envisioned for all of the participants that would be involved in taking this tour. So, Briefly stated, I guess the reason that I did the tour is because I really wanted to do it. Um, I've been in Seattle for 32 years now and becoming familiar with and interacting with um, the CID, whether it's you know on a volunteer basis, taking students into the district, uh, learning about the nonprofits and for-profit businesses and corporations. Um, it's it's been a long-term I think love affair with the neighborhood, um, learning about it and trying to figure out ways to enhance it, improve it um, and preserve all of those things that make that district just incredibly special. Um, the other thing is it's amazing how much time a person can spend learning about one neighborhood. Uh, Eugenia had mentioned building tradition that just came, uh, recently came out. Um, basically, I spent 14 years uh, researching for the book, and I spent 20 years looking at buildings, land use issues, um, and most of all, learning from the community, because the community can share those deep roots uh, that will indicate and enlighten you on the history of the neighborhood. But there's also this, this very real connection that um, residents, property owners, um, developers have with bridging what was history um, into contemporary development. Um, so this is how you, you look at the history of the neighborhood, but also what's there right now. And I tried to, to, to incorporate that within the tour. So in developing it, um, the 
the human aspect of these buildings and the neighborhood was really, really critical. Um, in order to give someone an idea of the neighborhood that has no knowledge at all about it, uh, I, I wanted to include a really brief history that looked at Asian American settlement, the CID, uh, try to be as succinct as possible, um, but to also include some information on immigration and the laws that really started shaping how people lived and where they lived uh, within the district. So that with the program prospectus, um, uh, I was charged with the task of looking at uh, 24 uh, stops uh, with six to eight descriptive sentences for each one of those stops. And I will tell you right now that it's really hard uh, to keep a narrative succinct when there is so much that can be said uh, about a single stop and to try to limit um, the number that was included. So in some of the, the stops, you'll notice that they actually act as a, a node for the participant where you may stand in one location and then kind of sweep along the intersection to take a look at what you can see if you're just standing in one area of, of, of an intersection. So that node may include two to four buildings, um, spaces within that single intersection. The goals of the tour, um, the stops reflect the history and they also re reflect the uniqueness of the Asian American community and contemporary development issues. So it provides a sample of building types and spaces that knit the community together. You'll experience um, those major building types. If you look in the district, so many of the buildings are either single room occupancy residential hotels, low rise commercial buildings, so a single or two story, uh, community institutions that really served as the backbone of development for social community identity. Public art is, is everywhere within the district, landscaping, open spaces. So the tour, um, I was hoping to bring in aspects of all of these possibilities so that a participant would be able to engage with um, all kinds of different sites, not just um, structures. So the goal that I had in mind was to reflect on the stop, um, but also a place memory, uh, something about the stop that you may look at it and think, well, the building is not all that wonderful, or why did you include this particular building? But that building also has a lot of in-depth history. It has a lot of place memory um, for the community. And I wanted to give you um, one example that looks at the northwest corner of the intersection of King and Maynard Avenue South. And with this, uh, Taylor's going to help me uh, with technology for which I am incredibly grateful. But this, is, uh, this reflects one of the stops that um, is in the tour. Okay, what you're looking at here, this is the Fuji Hotel building. It was considered to be one of the luxury hotel buildings uh, when it was constructed around 1890. Um, it was the first hotel in the CID that had a dormitory style sleeping arrangement uh, where the accommodations were not on the, on the first floor of the building or the basement level of the building, um, but they were put on the second and um, the third levels of the building. And it, while we may think that that's not really that big of a deal, today maybe not, but then when this, when this building was being used uh, for the Fuji Hotel, this was a really big innovation. Um, the, the building was um, purchased in 1899 by Chojiro Fuji. It, it originally, the name of the building was the Rainier Hotel. And if you could go to the second slide, please. Okay, with the Jackson Street regrade that takes place between 1907 and 1909 in the city, uh, you as a building owner had the option to elevate your building if you wanted to, but you had to sign a release form with the city of Seattle that if something happened while they were doing the regrade, that you would not hold the city responsible for any kind of damage that would take place to your building. So with the Fuji, um, they literally elevated the structure. Um, they did the regrade beneath it and they had the opportunity to build uh, an additional level or an additional story that was uh, part of the basement, but now they had the opportunity to have a commercial space or commercial spaces that would take the place of, of that at grade level. Um, so if, uh, let's see, 
Uh, if you can move to the third slide then. Okay, so as part of the Model Cities program that Seattle was a participant in, um, they were still looking for a site for a park. And this is a neighborhood that has always had a challenge that it has had the least amount of open space per capita of any of the neighborhoods in the city of Seattle. So in order to be able to find some kind of space that was going to give the residents who were living in residential hotels an opportunity to meet and to just get outdoors, um, they looked at the site that, uh, again, this was the Fuji Hotel, but they looked at this as the site that was going to be used um, that would require the demolition of what was low income housing and the construction of, of the first phase of Hing Hei Park. Um, so when you go to the park and when you go to uh, uh, on this tour, what you're looking at is this, is this half block expanse of Hing Hei Park but you're really looking at a park that was 37 years uh, separated by phase one and phase two. So what you're experiencing um, with all of these sites needs to include the voices of, of the community. And I'm gonna say the voices of the community both, both past and present. And most significantly in thinking about the tour, uh, we wanted to make sure that all of the stops were being evaluated by um, the CID stakeholders. So there were a number of organizations that kindly volunteered their time to take a look at these stops and to give us additions um, and any corrections that they would want to see. Um, the fourth issue here for a participant is that I wanted to establish a tour that would allow the participant to discover the CID as I know it, but to also develop their own avenue of curiosity curiosity and maybe even research of something that they find particularly compelling or interesting in the district. So this is a way that you can make um, uh, something very personal so that you're looking at a connection that goes far beyond just that narrow parameter of the tour and it becomes personal to the to the individual that is taking it. Um, so hopefully I haven't used more than my 10 minutes. Uh, I'd like to turn this back to Eugenia, who is going to introduce our first uh, and our next panel speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marie. Um, as always, that was a fascinating look at the neighborhood. Um, I know every time I um, hear one of Marie's talks, I, I learn um, something and that is definitely the case today. So next up is Leslie Morishita real estate development director at Interim CDA, a nonprofit affordable housing and community development organization created in 1969. With a focus on serving the API or Asian Pacific Islander community, Interim CDA provides multilingual, culturally competent housing and community building services to those disenfranchised due to lack of English, low acculturation and poverty. As Interim CDA's Real Estate Development Director, she leads efforts to find, buy, and develop real estate projects in the district to provide affordable housing for the community. Leslie, so question for you. In your work at Interim CDA, how have you seen affordable housing accessibility contributing to the CID's ongoing architectural and cultural preservation? Uh, second question. Please tell us about some of Interim's preservation projects involving former single room occupancy hotels or SROs. Am I? Okay, hello. Um, so thanks Eugenia. I, uh, you already introduced Interim and kind of gave an overview of what I do. So I won't go over that. Um, so as Eugenia said, I lead interim's housing development efforts. And um, you know, I think in answer to the question, in my uh, totally unbiased opinion, um, affordable housing accessibility contributes significantly to the architectural and cultural preservation of the international district neighborhood. And um, you know, for one, uh, so when we redevelop a historic building for low-income housing. It enables us to leverage significant public resources, which is money, to um, make the historic preservation of the building possible. And then, you know, we're doing so as a community-based organization with 
deep roots in the neighborhood and through a community development lens. So that means the restoration is done with care and love and love. And because it's our culture and our history, it's sacred. So beyond the renovation of the physical structure, we seek to keep the history of the buildings and their place in the community alive by telling their stories. I think Marie um, articulated uh, the, the importance of the essential nature of keeping those stories alive for people who are there today. And in making a way for the building to continue to serve the community with needed affordable housing and more, we see this as continuing the legacy and spirit in which these buildings were created in the first place. So uh, about some of our buildings, Interim has developed six buildings in the International District neighborhood, two are new construction, four were re historic renovation projects. Um, for two of the buildings, we did the Jihao Oak Tin, working with the Family Association in 1995, that was 30 years ago. And we also did the um, renovation of the Rex Hotel. These were both uh, SRO buildings where we worked with the owners as a development consultant to help them uh, get the public resources necessary to do those renovations. In 1994, Interim was able to purchase the NP Hotel which is, it's an SRO building. It was an SRO building that um, the upper residential floors had sat vacant for decades because of the city's Ozark Fire, Court and Fire Code ordinance. Um, so the owners at the time were unable to afford to bring the residential levels up to the fire ordinance code. So the, everybody had to move out. So that building, had been vacant for many years, except for the first floor, which was Maneki Restaurant, which is, I think it's the oldest Japanese restaurant in the area. Um, interim worked with the owner of the, well, we run a, wait, step back. So we reconfigured the SRO rooms into one bedrooms and two bedrooms and studios and uh, kept the second floor as SRO units because it's a, was um, seen as an endangered building type. And working with Bob Hale, uh, amazing historic preservation architect, the building was very lovingly restored and opened as low income housing that continues to this day. And we worked with uh, Kozo Nakayama, the then owner of the Maneki restaurant to help uh, redesign the space and bring it up to current day codes interim contributed funds towards the renovation of the restaurant space and um, provided Maneki restaurant with a long-term below market lease. The seeing the restaurant is a very integral part of the history of the building and um, important for the community. And so, um, and then we also worked with the Wing Luke Museum to create a historic exhibit in the lobby that tells about the history of the building and its important role as an anchor for the historic Nihonmachi community. Um, the next, and then we also did the Eastern Hotel building, which was another historic uh, SRO building that we purchased and renovated in 1998. It, is, has, it was all SRO buildings, all fully occupied at the time we purchased it. And um, it, we, we worked with the current residents to relocate them. And then they were all invited back when the renovation was completed. And the SRO rooms were reconfigured into studios, one and mostly studios and one bedroom units. There's one four bedroom unit. I love this story. There was a four bedroom unit that we created there because at the time we purchased the building, there was a very large Filipino family living there, they, they had five children and they were living in three adjacent SRO rooms and they very much wanted to be able to continue living there after the renovation. So we created one four bedroom unit there so they could return and they did. <laughs> and um, then we also created one unit off the alley for Donnie Chin and the International District Emergen Emergency Center. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Donnie Chin, um, he, he's, we called him the, um, the guardian angel for the neighborhood. And um, 
he dedicated his life to seeing to the, the, the safety and the needs of everybody in the neighborhood. And in exchange for uh, daily security patrols, we made this unit for him rent free. And we just, we knew the building would be better off with Donnie there. And to this day, that unit is still used by the International District Emergency Center um, rent free. And also with a group of community volunteers, we created a, a historic exhibit in the lobby called the Carlos Pelosa Memorial Exhibit. And it um, pays tribute to the Filipino cannery workers or uh, Alaskaros and the Filipino labor movement for which the Eastern Hotel uh, served as a backdrop. So I guess, so I go into all these details about the, the little stories of what we did beyond the physical structure because, so our approach to um, uh, historic preservation is we, we really seek to uphold the historic integrity of the physical structure of the historic buildings and uh, to center people and culture and to adapt them to serve the needs of the community today. And in this way, the way we see it, we're paying homage to those who came before us and keeping their legacy alive. I'd, I'm sorry, I have no idea how much time that took. <laughs> Sounds great, thank you, Leslie. Yeah. Um, the work that you do with interim to provide affordable housing is so important. So it's really fantastic for the community. Um, so next up is Tanya Wu. Give you a little time for the little slide for her to show up. Great. Um, so this is a good segue to our next speaker, Tanya Wu, whose family has owned a former single room occupancy hotel for decades. Uh, Tanya Wu's family has a long history in the Chinatown ID, going back to her great grandfather who co-founded um, the Lucknow Musical Association. Respect for history, community, and the importance of giving back have been instilled in each generation of the family. So, Tanya, so your family has owned the Louisa Hotel since the 1960s. What are some of the rewards and challenges of long-term building ownership in the neighborhood? Um, and also please tell us about your experience taking on the rehabilitation of the Louisa. As Leslie said, the biggest challenge for rehabbing all these old buildings is basically money. It's too expensive to bring all the buildings up to fire code, up to earthquake code with the code constantly changing. That's why you see a lot of these buildings in Chinatown with the upper floors basically shuttered and abandoned and only having the first floor who are, which are sprinklered, fire safe and earthquake safe. And so my father, when I was young, I grew up in that building, the Louisa Hotel. Um, I would play in the bakery, help eat the bread. Um, and then when I was older, I, I spent all my days after school in my dad's office. Um, he had all these hopes and dreams and plans for this building and how it could contribute to Chinatown. Um, he had plans drawn up, but he just basically, the, uh, the family, we could not afford it. Most of these buildings in Chinatown are owned by families who are, who are older. And when you're in your 60s, 70s and 80s, you don't wanna take on a multi-million dollar loan to upgrade your building. And so he was never able to do it. Um, he passed away when I was really young. And so the building upper floors were just were abandoned. Um, there was no electricity up there, but the ground floor was in use. Um, and so many, 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 many years later on Christmas Eve of December, 2013, the roof caught on fire on the Western half of the building. And basically half the building had to be demolished. The um, alley wall was in danger of collapsing onto our neighbors. Um, the top floor had collapsed onto the floors beneath it. The building uh, could no longer be used. Um, and so many of the businesses that were in the building were legacy businesses. They had to close their stores on the busiest shopping day in Chinatown of the year. And many of them couldn't go back in. They had to leave their things there. Um, and basically, we had to decide, my family, whether we were going to rebuild, whether we had to sell the building or just shutter it and leave it there. And so we decided the next day that we were gonna rebuild. And for a whole year, we worked on 
stabilizing, doing emergency stabilization of the building, saving the facade and trying to save as much of the interior of the um, destroyed site as we could. And so it was quite a bit of a challenge because we very, very quickly had to apply for federal and state historic tax credits this to help fund the whole um, rebuild. And we had such a tremendous outpouring of help from the city, the state, um, and from the community. And also the community also helped support all the businesses that had to close. Um, and so through this process of you know, exploring the building right before demolition and getting it ready for it to be stabilized. I've learned so much about this building and I learned so much about my father that I never really knew because he died when I was so young. Like just walking through the halls and, and imagining all the stories and all the people who had lived in these apartments. Basically, we found uh, graffiti from World War II sailors who had docked here, um, graffiti from the USS Missouri, uh, the USS Mercy, these different ships that were here. So as we come into the halls and, and hang out in the, in the um, music halls and gambling areas, uh, we found like secret passageways, we found perfume bottles and walls, coins and floors, notes, and all kinds of things from people who have been there before, calendars. And we wanted to tell these stories, we wanted to preserve these stories, so we saved as much as we could. Um, and thanks to like all of the state and, and federal tax credits, we were able to save much of the woodwork, the trim, the doors, the stairs, and of course the facade. Um, so this building was built in 1909. And we, one of the biggest challenges was having half of the building gone, was having to recreate and replicate what used to be there. And so it took us three years to design and permit and to be able to find the funds to rebuild. And we were able to partner with a local family, the Gorder family, who really believed in um, workforce housing. And that was able to help so much with being able to bring in more people to live closer to the downtown Seattle core. Um, and so we had an amazing time designing the building to look like it used to look, how the architects had intended to look. We um, to restore the facade, we recreate the hallways and during construction, the crews were in the basement, they took down a drywall and found these beautiful, well-preserved prohibition era jazz murals. We were constantly learning so much about the history of the building. We had no idea there was a jazz hall that was in the basement. And we decided that we had to save these murals and it was quite a fight having to change the permits, having to change everything. But we thought that was a very important part of history that needed to be preserved. And it was like, and we just later discovered it's the only, only remnants left of jazz clubs in Seattle. And so biggest challenges turn out to be the biggest rewards. Um, being able to see the building now, we just opened last year 2019 in June to 84 units of workforce housing and ground floor retail. And it's just so, so amazing to be able to walk through the halls and instead of seeing just pigeons and the red tailed hawk that would hunt these pigeons, it's, seeing, it's hearing laughter and seeing people. It's always so odd to just to walk around and see someone that you know or having the halls filled with energy. It's, it's the biggest reward being able to put this building back instead of it being just a dark little hole <laughs> where it was not being used. And so a lot of the challenges were basically trying to stay within budget, trying to find a budget for something, being able to, we never knew what was gonna happen next to this building. During construction, we had a wall collapse because a wall that's hundred years old was definitely not gonna be able to support something that we thought it would be. And so it was quite a rewarding challenge to be able to walk on the sidewalks, especially since we're seeing our businesses reopen. We had Susu and our Korean barbecue restaurant, Begopa open recently, our uh, milk tea. And we're very excited to see Hong Kong restaurant open soon. And so it gives me so much joy to be able to walk 
down the street and see people lined up outside, enjoying the building, going upstairs, go home and be with their friends and family. Whereas in the past, this building was just empty and quite desolate. And so being a steward of this building has made me realize that this building is gonna be here. It's been here for a hundred years. It'll be here for another hundred years. We are gonna come and go, but it's so important that we tell the stories of the people who came before us, all those people who worked so hard, who sacrificed, left their families to come here and work and send money back and bring their families over so that we can be here. We have to tell these stories and we have to appreciate and honor their legacy and make sure that the future generations that come after us realize the sacrifices and the hard work and carry on these stories and be able to appreciate what happened. And so these buildings, hold so much meaning, hold so much stories, tragedy, everything has to be remembered, has to be documented and has to be carried on. Otherwise, you know, it'll just be lost and it won't be there. And so it's very important that for the future generation to look at their family buildings and to hopefully do something to help save them and help bring them back to code. And it's very difficult, but hopefully, Hopefully there's a good support network and a good support structure that can help. And so, as you see slowly, like in the news, some buildings have been experiencing fires and tragedy and, and not being able to be used. And so very slowly I hope that, you know, future generations will realize that they have to play the part in bringing these buildings back up to code and be able to carry on these stories. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much. So what a preservation success story that is. Thank you and your family for taking on such a challenging project. Um, the Louisa Hotel Project is also a recipient of Historic Seattle's Community Investment Award in 2020. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to celebrate in person. Uh, we usually have an benef annual benefit uh, where we recognize preservation projects. Um, hopefully, we can all gather again next year. So our next speaker, uh, gives us an opportunity to look at the importance of small businesses in the CID. Karen Akata Sakata is the owner of the Bush Garden Restaurant and Bar, a legacy business that has been operating in the neighborhood since 1953. She and her husband purchased the business in 1996 from original owners Roy and John Seiko. Karen actually worked as a waitress at the Bush Garden when she was in high school, so her association with the business goes way back. Karen, uh, many tourists and visitors to the CID miss or overlook that the district is a close-knit community of neighbors, business owners, artists, workers, etc. As the owner of a beloved staple, how have these relationships and community ties shaped the legacy of Bush Garden? And what does the future hold for the Bush Garden? Okay, well, um, the legacy, I don't, for people who are in new to Seattle. Um, you know, the, the restaurant started there in 1957 in that location, and it was huge. It was before the days of, of big hotels. It was before the days of very many, um, any chains or, you know, things like, I think Dags was the local hamburger place. Dicks and Dags were the two, two places that were around, but, and it was, you know, it was a gathering place for a of not just Japanese American community, but um, a lot of community events because there were no large venues around. But this place could hold three, three to four hundred people. On uh, it was a whole second floor plus the first floor, and um, it was designed originally to be very high end. There was small rooms that people could have business meetings, so there were phones in in all the rooms where people could sit down, have lunch, and have their business meeting and eat a great great lunch and um, lunch or dinner. And it was it was really an amazing place. There were a whole fleet of, I worked as a bus girl. I started working as a bus girl. So that, that there was a lot of high school students that all worked there. Um, our job was just to clean the rooms. And then there was a lot of waitresses and the sh down in the kitchen, a lot of the chefs from Japan were all working down there. Um, it was an exciting place to be. It was like a, a really small town where, um, you know, Japanese community, Japanese culture could, you know, 
kind of, we could be in a small village pretty much. Um, I think I remember it also as a place where my family would gather. Um, our, all our, a lot of our Mother's Day events were held there at the restaurant because then everybody could bring their whole family and everybody could eat with nobody having to do the work. Um, but the place holds a lot. It's been a, um, Bush was a place where a lot of community events were held. Um, fundraisers were held. I know the JCL would hold their events there. Um, community, um, the Lions Club would had, you know, I think they had an event that went every Thanksgiving Eve and it was called Reno Night and people from all over the community would come. Um, business people, I mean, it was a good place for those um, out long afternoon business lunches. Um, it was a place where the Japanese community, maybe the Japanese dance group would um, hold their dance recital there or people would have weddings or it was after funeral gatherings, um, people would, um, you know, join and share there too. So it was, it was a place where, you know, it filled a lot of uh, roles family lives on a regular basis is where you know people would go on their prom nights special prom nights there were limousines that would pull up and um the waitresses all wore kimonos it was very very fancy and um i know it's just a place where people go even before events after events and even even up until it was last open i feel like um people would come in for meetings they would discuss or plan or prepare, or after a meeting, they would come in and talk about what happened at the meeting. You know, just it was a place for a community to really, really connect. And um, over generations, really, um, we had you know two or three generations of people that have been through there. We um, would get visitors that had come for the first time from from Texas or wherever, and they would end up visiting with us there and um you know making a connection so i think that we had a lot of regulars that have been there for generate you know a couple generations we have people that are brand new that um found it for the first time and then you know maybe um we've even had um you know somebody reserved it for an event uh for karaoke and then they ended up coming back pretty much year after year after year so they they've seen Seen, seen the changes and been become part of the Bush community for, for you know, 60, you know, regular years. It was kind of their thing to do when they came to Seattle. So, um, you know, when the, there was a uh, Japanese artist that came from Japan and she had a concert here in Seattle and she came to Bush Garden for dinner. And, um, you know, it was, it's just been a great gathering place. Um, Uncle Bob, Bob Santos, for those of you who don't know, he was uh, considered the mayor of the International District, Chinatown International District. And Uncle Bob was a regular. There were many um, elected, elected would show up every once in a while and, and, and join us. A lot of community organizations, I know as part of the Japanese Community and Cultural Center and a lot of our meetings, meetings after meetings and meetings before meetings were held there. Um, it's, the Bush has been a place for political activism, I would say too. Um, Ruth Wu, I know that she, she used to come for lunch and have, I don't know how many meetings very often to talk about strategy, you know, how to, how to organize and strategy in the community to work, to get what we needed in the community. So, um, it's a place where they, you know, I don't know, back in the day, the torchlight parade in part of Seafair, um, they would organize and plan what the floats, I don't know if you've, they used to have floats during the torchlight parade and they would even plan how they're gonna decorate those and they had where, you know, design it and plan it and, you know, all the people would gather that participated in building it. So, um, you know, there was a lot, you know, it's just, it's just meant so much to people in the community. So, um, you know, the building has been sold. It was, the building got sold in 2016 and the goal 
of the developers is they want to build a 17 story building there and so um they're still going through their process so um so nothing has happened yet but the covid you know have needing to close um because of covid it's been difficult to figure out a way to try and reopen especially because karaoke was our um you know, is what we're, we've been, become known for. And so um, anyway, in terms of where we're going next, because of the plans for the building to um, be demolished, um, that we had to look for another place. So um, luckily we're, um, we're asked to be a part of the new place that interim is building. Um, Bob's place um, on right across the street from the loop, and we're looking forward to when that gets developed. Um, and at this time, because we've been closed for a while, you know, in terms of the future, we're thinking that um, we're going to have to um, to close our doors temporarily until till the time um, comes to. We haven't announced it. Formal, formally announced it, but um, that's the direction where we're kind of going in. So um, I think, I don't know. Sorry, I'm not, uh, I think that's, is that enough, Eugenia? Yeah, that's, that's great, Karen, thank you. It's, and it's, as I just, I think you can see a pattern of all the speakers before you, it's all about the stories and the Bush Garden is, is so much about the people. Um, and so uh, 67 years is a remarkable run for a restaurant and bar and 24 of those under your helm. Mm -hmm. And um, and as uh, we heard Karen discuss, the Bush Garden is so much more than a restaurant and bar. It's a community gathering place. Um, we know there are challenging times for small businesses and we wish you all the best as you reinvent this beloved place. Karen, thank you. So our final speaker, this is the operations director at the Friends of a Little Saigon is a social, economic, and cultural hub of the Vietnamese community in the Puget Sound region. The neighborhood is also a vital part of the Chinatown ID. Friends of Little Saigon was established in 2011 at the start of massive redevelopment in Little Saigon. Its mission is to preserve and enhance Little Saigon's cultural, economic, and historic vitality. So Valerie, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so Little Saigon has a very different vibe, look and feel than its neighbors, uh, Chinatown and Japantown. One of the notable differences being fewer housing options and many, many small businesses. How does this Im impact the culture and preservation of the neighborhood? Um, also, there's a new city park proposed for the neighborhood. When, what impact do you think the new park will have in this? So as you all may know, Little Saigon is predominantly a commercial business district, so relatively um, fewer residential buildings than the Chinatown, Japantown side of the neighborhood. Um, there's numerous restaurants, grocery stores, professional services, cafes, and more in Little Saigon. It is uh, seen as a cultural home for many Vietnamese Americans across the region and the state. So as a, a business district, Little Saigon has a solid set of cultural roots. The businesses are a huge contributor to the Vietnamese American culture in the area. Um, the businesses provide culturally and linguistically appropriate goods and services to people, and people come from across the region and feel like this is their cultural home. And uh, as you suggested, there are some challenges that come along with being predominantly a business district. Um, customers are passing through, stopping by for a shopping trip, a quick meal, a service, and then they just leave. So without much of a residential base until recently, the neighborhood has sometimes been an afterthought. Um, it takes a, a lot of deliberate and concerted effort to preserve a place in community when you don't have a strong residential base. So it's, it's been a challenge to get community activated and engaged in the neighborhood, especially if people don't live there and it's not part of their everyday experience. So Friends of Little Saigon, we work um, we work hard to engage our small businesses, although they're already very strapped for time and have a hard time committing to showing up for activities outside of the workplace. Um, that's not to say that there aren't extremely vocal and active business owners or employees in the neighborhood, it's just that much harder. 
So having a residential base is extremely important for cultural preservation. It's important for the businesses to have residential customers in close proximity. It's also uh, important for the neighborhood to have people of different generations living here and interested in the well-being of the community in the, the long term. And as we know from the elections, it's very important to have a residential base uh, for voting in local elections, which helps to shape the policies that either preserve or displace communities. So that's my answer to your first question. And related to the park, um, hopefully you all know that there's a park coming into Little Saigon. It's on uh, King Street, across the street from Lamb Seafood. So we're really excited about this park. Um, it's been a number of years in the making with a lot of community input. And our hope is that uh, in the near future when we can all gather again, it'll be a place for community to come together and host events. It'll be a nice uh, retreat for pedestrians to be tucked away from traffic and cars. Um, it's going to be a place for residents in the neighborhood and employees to take a break from their shifts and hang out with each other. And it'll, uh, we've taken a lot of uh, effort to incorporate and celebrate Vietnamese American culture in the design and public art in the park. And we'll bring together the uh, various cultures in the neighborhood. And hopefully our, our intent is that the park um, makes a statement that Little Saigon is an established place and that we're here to stay and it's a place to, uh, worthy of stopping in a destination, not just a place to pass through quickly. Great, thank you, Valerie. Um, so there are a lot of exciting things happening in the future of Little Saigon and we look forward to seeing all the great progress. Um, actually, one of historic Seattle's property that offers uh, affordable housing, uh, Victorian row apartments is just gonna be right next to the park. So that's exciting. Uh, um, so uh, we heard, we just heard from five remarkable women who contribute so much to the Chinatown ID. At this point, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, I know some of you have been typing your questions in the chat, um, and so I'm gonna read them out in the order that they um, came in. And so in terms of looking at the time, um, we may or may not get to all of them. If, if we don't, then um, we can be sure to still somehow respond to your, to your questions. So the first question uh, is from John McWilliams, who asked, the mid, the mid 20th century Bank of America building on King Street has abstract ornamentation on the facade. Does anyone know if the architect solicited input from community stakeholders on what would be an appropriate expression of their aspirations? Are the ornaments intended to symbolize anything in particular? Let's see. Marie, is that, do you know much about? About that building. So definitely the building was built and it predated the, establish, um, the establishment of the International Special Review District. So it would not have been, um, been reviewed by the board. Um, I, don't... I have my doubts that there was any kind of interaction um, on the design of the building with community input. They just, they just weren't, they weren't at a position to do that. Um, what I was thinking of when you were mentioning the building, though, is that that was the site of the old Welcome Hotel, which was another one of the buildings that was owned and operated by the Rainer Heat and Power Company. Um, and it was that whole block, in fact, that whole half block that included um, uh, the expansion of Hing Hay Park. Uh, all of those buildings that were kind of wrapping around the corner that would include the site that, that turned into the bank or that was redeveloped as the bank uh, used to be um, wooden framed SRO buildings. That I can tell you. Um, and they were just literally thrown up very, very quickly um, around the time, well, right before the regrade project. Thanks, Marie. Um, I knew you'd be the you, you have in your memory bank, <laughs> every block in, in, on every street in the district. So that's super helpful. It's really so. scary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> good, good for cocktail uh, chatter, I guess. Um, so we have another question from Annette Holland, who says, 
um, during the tour and now listening to the backstories. I am so intrigued and would love to see the basements and their hidden treasures. Would it be possible to tour the basements of some of these amazing SRO hotels? Um, obviously we are in, with the pandemic right now, I don't think we can do physical tours of, of buildings, but let's say in the future when we reopened up, um, um, does anyone want to take this one? Or I guess it really depends on whether it's privately owned or owned by a nonprofit. Um, yeah. I think contact the Wing Luke Museum. Um, they do a couple of tours and I remember them doing a, a prohibition tour once and they came down to the basement to look at the murals. And so um, they offer, they used to offer a whole very a wide selection of tours. And I think it'd be, they used to offer one on all the jazz clubs that used to be in Chinatown as well. And so I think they would be a great person to contact and maybe suggest or see if they have something there that they can plan out. Great, thanks Tanya. Yeah, the Wing Luke Museum is a great resource um, for many things. Uh, okay, let's see, we have um, a question from Mary Jean Gilman. Uh, what will be the visible legacy of Bush Gardens original location when the development occurs? <laughs> Karen, that's, um, a, <laughs> that's a whole other hour. Yeah, right? that's a whole other, um, actually the, the, the building, the people who are doing the development there have shifted the design um, several times already. And the most recent, the first original one was going to, they were going to try and maintain the facade. The second version, there, there was a little bit of the facade still there, idea of the facade still there. And then the third most recent design that I've seen was it was complete, everything was completely gone. And it was, um, yeah, it doesn't look like um, the neighbor, it doesn't, you know, really fit the neighborhood. The facade doesn't look like it fits the neighborhood as much, you know, as it could. So there's really not much left there at all. Um, we, a, a small group of us have been trying to work together to, uh, including Eugenia to, and Leslie, um, to think about ways of offering an alternative design or alternative to what they have designed. Um, the 17 stories right next, but up against our next, the next building, which is part of the historic district. And um, it just would overshadow the neighborhood. And I think, um, you know, rather than, you know, kind of feel encroaching buildings on top of the neighborhood, the international district, that it feels like we would like to see something different that more complements the neighborhood, that complements the idea of maintaining community and supporting community. So we've been trying to put together an alter alternative vision, um, but the developers, you know, still are proceeding with their design. So we'll see where it goes. Yes, we're not giving up yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it looks like we have uh, another question from Annette Holland. On the sidewalk near the Wing Luke Museum, I think we saw purple glass tiles. Does anyone know why they are there and who installed them? Um, so Annette, you're talking about the prism lights. Um, they're in the CID and also you'll see them in Pioneer Square as mm -hmm. well. And um, underneath the sidewalk, there are area ways. Um, and so it provides light uh, down into those area ways and into the basement. Um, and they're, they're historic, they're actually protected or they should be. Um, and sometimes you see the, the whole, there are holes where the lights used to be and they've been filled in with concrete or they're just still holes. And so it's not probably the most safe thing if you're walking around there. Um, but generally that's all, that's what they are. If, um, if anyone else has anything to add, if you know more. And I know they are expensive to replace because you can't just, buy these anymore and plop them in um, and have the new ones made are it's quite it's quite costly great for they're purple <laughs> i'm just gonna contribute i know they're purple because the glass lacks a special ingredient that was added later in the 20th century for glass making but they're old and they lack that material and it turns purple for that reason great thank you for that for that info Hey, let's, uh, Stephanie Johnson Tolliver asked about the Bucket of Blood murals. Yes, so we're in the process of 
we have an amazing conservator who lives on Grays Harbor and travels in to preserve these murals, conserve these murals. Um, because of COVID, it's been a little tough, but we we're hoping within the next year or so that we will be able to pull back the curtain to that window you see there on um, 7th and King. So people could actually look down and see the murals, see um, Club Royale sign and see the 13 different figures dressed in their fur coats and top hats descending down the stairs into the jazz club. So um, hopefully within next year, um, you'll be able to see them. There are a couple other jazz club murals down the basement, but unfortunately only uh, residents of the building can see them, but we are working to preserve those next after the murals from the street. Great, thank you, Tanya. And I see that on the chat. There's some really great information on the chat, um, really wonderful comments and some info. And Mimi from the Wing Loop mentioned that um, the Wing currently does a virtual tour of the Yik Fong building, which was preserved and restored to the SRO era. You can check out their website for tours. Um, little, a little Zoom tip in the chat uh, box there. There are these three little, dot, three little dots. If you click on that, you can actually save the, uh, the chat. So you can save it to your computer. Um, and so you don't have to like, you know, do screenshots or like, you know, write anything down. <laughs> but um, so I don't think there are any more questions. Um, I want to thank all of our wonderful speakers. Um, I want to thank History Link. Um, shout out to Jennifer Ott, who's, who's on this event uh, for helping us develop this program. Um, Taylor, thank you. Naomi, thank you. And uh, with that, we are, it's 601. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Um, have a good rest of your evening and stay safe.